and we're going to get right into it. Uh, we're making some progress here. Uh, all right, we are in chapter 10. How, Brother Justin, I know you track these kind of things. How long have we been on, in this study? You remember? Uh, a couple, couple years. years. All right. Okay, you be quiet. We're moving on. <laughs> Forget I asked the question. All right. Psalm chapter 10. And uh, for, in my defense, okay, we weren't consistently in it. We are now, so we're making some progress. All right. Uh, Psalm chapter number 10. And uh, I'm going to start reading in verse number 1. And what I want to remind you of is that the theme of the Bible is the king and his kingdom. Um, oftentimes, as independent Bible-believing Baptists, we tend to think that the theme of the Bible is, is New Testament salvation, and thank God for that. But the theme of the Bible is not. As a matter of fact, most of the Bible, uh, most of the Old Testament, has to do with the king and his kingdom. And that's why so much prophecy in the Old Testament is tied to the second coming of Jesus Christ, and, and, and more so than even the first coming. All right? And what you'll find is that the two central figures in the Bible are the Lord Jesus Christ as the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords and the Antichrist. And, and you'll find that uh, throughout uh, prophecy, and you'll find in the book of Psalms. Uh, and again, Psalms is an amazing book. Right here you have it, uh, a great reminder of the fact that Psalms are, are, are words inspired by God that were put to music, and oftentimes it dealt with a man's, uh, in, historically speaking, a man's trouble and how he dealt with that trouble with God's help, and how he called out to God, and how he leaned, out, leaned on the Lord for his strength, and for his deliverance from his enemies. David was a man after God's own heart, but he was a man of trouble. The Bible says of Jesus Christ, he was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. The, the Bible says man is born into trouble as the sparks fly upward. Just because you get saved doesn't mean your trouble goes away. Amen? There's trouble. Uh, and what you learn from Psalms practically is a lot about learning to lean on the Lord for deliverance. All right? But from a doctrinal or a prophetic uh, standpoint, there's a lot in here about uh, the end times. And we're going to pick up here, start in verse 1 again. Why standest thou afar off, O Lord? Why hidest thou thyself in times of trouble? And we talked about the, the times uh, that are spoken of in Daniel. Uh, times, time and half a time, three and a half years of great tribulation prophetically speaking, the wicked in his pride doth persecute the poor. Let them be taken in the devices that they have imagined. And uh, here's what I will challenge you to do tonight. Look in your Bible. Uh, look, get a concordance. Get a strongest concordance. There are many of you get a, an app on your phone or on your laptop and type in the word device. Type in the word devices. And you know what you'll find? You will never find in this book a positive reference to the word device or devices. It's always negative. Think about this. The word devil, D-E-V-I, it's there. Hear about this, vice, a vice. It's there. It's like a trap. It's a device. It's something that's going to trap you is really what it is. All right? And, and we get so used to devices all around us. Am I right about that? And, and so uh, think about that. Some of these devices aren't that great. Some smartphones aren't that smart for you to constantly be looking at. Amen? All right? Uh, but it says here, the devices that they have imagined. The wicked he's talking about there is, is the wicked generally, but also in reference to a person. Uh, go, take your hand and go to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. For some of you, this is just review. And that's okay. Uh, it's good to review it. It's good to review things over and over and over. Uh, Peter says, I, I want to stir you up by putting you in remembrance. Amen? Amen? And he says, after my decease, I would have you in remembrance of these things though ye know them, and be established in them. So some things you know, and you, you are established in them, but you need to hear them again. And you hear them again. And, and uh, when it comes to uh, the reference of the wicked in your Bible, sometimes it's a reference to the wicked, generally speaking. But I think here in the context, what we're going to find out is it's not just that. Uh, look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, and look at verse number 7. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Now, we did a series... I don't know how long ago, a year ago, on the seven mysteries explained from the Bible. Seven mysteries in the New Testament. And uh, the mystery of godliness is what? It's God manifest in the flesh, right? The mystery of iniquity is that, but inverted to Satan. The mystery of iniquity is Satan manifest in the flesh through the Antichrist. All right, that's what's being talked about here in 2 Thessalonians 2. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way, and then shall that wicked, notice it's capitalized, that wicked be revealed. Why does it say then? 
because after the Antichrist, uh, there's an assassination attempt on his life. And the Bible talks about in Revelation 13, the beast comes out of the bottomless pit, uh, and perdition enters into the man. No differently than with what you have with Judas. And after that, he's not just called the man of sin, but rather the son of perdition. Uh, look, if you would, at verse number uh, 3, uh, talking about the falling away. Uh, look at the end of the verse, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, comma, the son of perdition. So the mystery of iniquity, no different than Jesus Christ had a, myst uh, had a ministry on the earth, and there was a certain time, you guys remember him saying, my time has not yet come, my time has not yet come, and they try to ask him to do miracles, he goes, it's not time yet, boys, right? His mom comes to him, okay, can, you, can you turn the water into wine? Well, my time's not yet, and so on and so forth. Why was that? There was a timetable in which he was to reveal himself to the people that he was the Messiah, that he was God manifest in the flesh. There was a specific time for that. And you know what the devil does in our lives? He's a sub, he tries to substitute the, the, the things that the Lord wants to do in our lives. You know what you ought to get excited about? The Word of God. You know what he'll try to do? He'll try to hand you a football game so you get excited about this. Uh, you ought to get excited about people getting saved. When someone talks about someone getting saved, Christians should be shouting, they should be excited, and oftentimes Christians come and hear someone get saved, they go, praise the Lord. You say, why? Because there's been a lot of substitutes all week long to what should be your excitement and your fulfillment. Am I right about that? And so what the devil does, he tries to substitute everything that the Lord does. He's a mimicker, he's an imitator, that's what he does. And so he sees that in the life of Jesus Christ, there's a timetable and it's not until that time that he reveals himself for who he is. You know what the Antichrist does? The same thing. He comes as a, as a great a man of peace, and then at a certain point in the, in the tribulation, no longer that. He's now the son of perdition. And that's what that mystery of iniquity is. And he says, then shall that wicked, capital W, be revealed. Look at John chapter number 1. John chapter number 1. And notice that the, the uh, W in the word wicked in uh, 2 Thessalonians is capitalized because it's talking about a person. John chapter number 1. So again, why am I looking at this? Why are we looking at this? We're looking at this because uh, I'm trying to get you to see that when David speaks of the wicked in Psalm chapter number 10, he's not just referring to the wicked in general. We're going to see that as we continue to go on. He's talking about the wicked as a person, all right, a specific person. Uh, look at John chapter number 1. Now let me ask you a question real quick. Do you have the Word of God in your hand? Okay, do you have the words of God in your hand? Yeah, amen, yes you do, all right? And uh, so we understand we have the word of God, but look at John chapter 1 and look at verse number 12. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. We're talking about a person here, and that person is Jesus Christ. We can agree on that. Uh, look down at verse number 14. And the word was made Flesh. Now notice, it's capitalized. Why is that? Because it's not just a reference to the Bible or the words of God, but to the person, Jesus Christ. And so it's capitalized. Why is it capitalized in 2 Thessalonians 2, talking about the Antichrist? Because it's talking about a person. All right. And so going back to Psalm, go back to Psalm chapter 10, going back there, what I want to remind you of as we work through this uh, by way of review, is that uh, this is not just a reference to the wicked, generally speaking, uh, but a reference to the Antichrist himself. And here's the characteristics uh, of the, the enemy of the Lord. Uh, verse 3, For the wicked boasteth of his heart's desire, and blesseth the covetous, whom the Lord abhorreth. The wicked, through the pride of his countenance, will not seek after God. God is not in all his thoughts. His ways are always grievous. Thy judgments, God's judgments, are far above out of his sight. As for all his enemies, he puffeth at them. We talked about the fact that uh, the devil is referred to in the Bible as the dragon. He has said in his heart, I shall not be moved, for I shall never be in adversity. You say, what is that? Pride. You see pride just oozing out of this individual. All right? Uh, keep your hand here and go to Isaiah chapter number 14. Uh, the Bible says that the Lord uh, abhors pride. Uh, it's one of the abomin abomin uh, abominable things, according to Proverbs chapter 6, is a proud look. You say, what's that? This. That's a proud look. You know, I'm not going to listen. I'm not going to be moved. I'll never be in adversity. I, I, I. Uh, good rule of thumb is never say never. Amen? All right? Isaiah 14, and look at uh, verse number 12. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son 
of the morning. Notice that he's not called the morning star. All right, New Bibles change that, and they call Lucifer the morning star when Revelation 22, 16 says that Jesus Christ is the morning star, not Satan. All right? Now look at, uh, look at verse uh, 13. We're talking about Lucifer, right? Look what it says here in verse 13. For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. Notice he speaks in his heart. That's something we talked about on Sunday, the heart of the matter. Conversations start where? In the heart. And Lucifer said, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. You say, what is that? Pride. Pride. And that's why he fell. And part of Isaiah 14 has to do with eternity past. But if you look at the rest of it, part of it has to do with when he's brought down to hell. Guys, can I say this? Satan has not yet been brought down to hell. The world paints Satan like a little ca cartoon character with a red pajama suit and a pitchfork. And he's in hell, you know? That is not him. The Bible calls him the prince and power of the air. And he's walking about, seeking whom he may devour. He's not there yet. Uh, thankfully, someday, the Lord's going to cast him. We sing that song, The tempter will be banished. We'll lay our burdens down. Man, I love that song. The tempter are going to be banished. Think about this. Come, think about a day when you never have to watch what you think. Husbands, you never have to watch what you say. Amen. <laughs> all right? All right, never say the wrong thing. Never think the wrong thing. It's all right. You say, why? The tempter's banished. The tempter's banished. Uh, go back to Psalm chapter number 10. I'm just trying to show you here, paint the picture that uh, whoever this person is, whoever this wicked person is, uh, this is someone who is at, at diametrically opposed in character and in action to the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. All right? Uh, look what it says here in verse 7. His mouth is full of cursing and deceit and fraud. Under his tongue is mischief and vanity. He sitteth in the lurking places of the villages. In the secret places doth he murder the innocent. His eyes are privily set against the poor. Now, not to... Again, rehash all of it, but what we talked about in, in general overview is that you'll find David speaks about the poor, the poor, the poor. Can I say this? David wasn't poor. He's the king. Am I right about that? He's not in poverty himself. Why is he talking about the poor? If he's being persecuted, historically it's him being persecuted, and he keeps talking about the poor. Now, this is not like the poor in spirit or the meek or anything like that. It is literally the poor. And you'll notice that whoever this person is of great power, he's attacking the poor, going after the poor. Uh, now, let me get you to think about this for a little bit. We are in the election season, are we not? Every politician talks about how they're looking out for the poor. Uh, look at Mark chapter number 14. Go to Mark chapter 14. When someone talks about uh, how they're really looking out for the poor, and... They're not coming to, uh, at it from the standpoint of the Word of God like David was. Watch out. What they're doing is they're speaking great swelling words of vanity to deceive the minds of those that don't know the truth. All right? Uh, Mark chapter 14. And politicians, I'll tell you, you'll see it. Uh, look at Mark 14. And uh, look, if you would, at verse 3. And being in Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, as he sat at meat, there came a woman having an alabaster box of ointment and spikenard, very precious, and she brake the box and poured it on his head. And there were some that had indignation within themselves and said, Why was this waste of the ointment made? Now, it says there, there were some that said that. Right? That's what the Bible says. But you know what you got to do? This is what's interesting about comparing Scripture with Scripture. It says there were some that said this. Uh, but you know what you notice in a group? Usually there's someone that's leading the sense of murmuring, the sense of discontentment. There's usually one ringleader there. Uh, look at the Gospel of John. Go over there. This has to do with Psalms, I promise you, okay? Uh, John, and uh, look, if you would, at John chapter number, let's go back here. John chapter... Let's see here, I believe it's 12, John chapter 12, John chapter 12, and look at verse 3, Then took Mary a pound of ointment of spikenard, very costly, and anointed the feet of Jesus, and wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the odor of the ointment. Then saith one, 
of his disciples. Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, which should betray him, why was not this ointment sold for 300 pence and given to the poor? Now let me ask you a question. Does, does Judas care about the poor? No. He's using them as a front to get to something. What is it? Power and money. There's a politician for you. You know what the Antichrist does at the end times? He shows up on the world scene and says, I'm going to take care of all of you. Matter of fact, we're going to take from those that are rich and give to those that are poor. We're going to make sure everything's equal, everything's fair. And, and that's how he shows up. Peace. He brings peace, right? Well, by the end of that thing, the mask is taken off. And, uh, you know, with technology, you can track people anywhere they go. You can. Uh, you know, and, and I'm, not, I'm not a conspiracy guy. It's just, this isn't a conspiracy. It's just technology. If you know anything about technology, it is what it is. Um, as a matter of fact, today at work, I, I work with a bunch of 20-somethings. And one of the guys says, I used to work for a contractor that did work for Google. And what we would do is we would listen. They would play for us thousands of, you ever go to your Google and go, you know, I'm not going to do it because if I do it right now, it'll actually sp spin out of control and start, you know, doing what, you know, try to search for something when I don't want it to. But if I say, and I'll be careful, if I say, okay, Google, good, then come on. If I say that real loud, it'll say, it'll listen. What do you want to say? Check out these pictures. Great, wonderful. <laughs> that is exactly what I was worried about. Okay, so I don't care about the pictures. That's what I was worried about. Anyways, I was watching something the other day, and, and someone said, okay, and that thing came on again. You always say, what is it? It's always listening. Right. What do you think is going to happen in the end times? You're going to have the ability to have someone that listens to everything that goes on, and lur in, the, in the lurking places, he sitteth privily, and he has his eyes on the poor. Now, why is it that he's attacking the poor? Well, in the book of Revelation, we'll go ahead and turn that off behind us. We know we're in Psalms, right, guys? Okay, all right. So, uh, in the book of Revelation, what we understand is that anyone that doesn't take the mark of the beast, you say, what happens to them? They can't buy, and they can't sell, and they're cut out of the economy, so to speak. They're cut out of commerce. You know what they become? Poor. So, whoever doesn't take the mark and doesn't worship the image of the beast, they are poor, and they're going to be persecuted. And what's interesting is there's only two people in your Bible that are ever called the son of perdition. One is Judas, and one is the Antichrist in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And there's a connection between those two. All right? I won't go through all that again, but the point is this. When someone shows up talking about how they're caring about the poor, uh, and they come at it from a deceitful and fraudulent aspect, as you read about, go back to Psalm 10, as you read here in, in chapter 10 and verse 7, his mouth is full of cursing and deceit and fraud, under his tongue is mischief and vanity. And it says, He sitteth in the lurking places of the villages. In the secret places doth he murder the innocent. His eyes are privily set against the poor. He lieth in wait secretly as a lion in his den. Now that phrase, lieth in wait, shows up two other times in your Bible. Look at Proverbs chapter number 7. He lieth in wait. Proverbs chapter number 7. Man, isn't that a weird thing? Just try to whisper, okay, and the thing comes on, you know? Strange. Uh, Proverbs chapter number 7, and look at uh, verse number 12. Uh, verse number 11, she is loud and stubborn. You say, who is this? This is, uh, according to verse 10, a woman uh, that has the attire of an harlot, and she's subtle of heart, all right? The devil was the most, uh, the serpent was the most subtle beast of the earth, Genesis chapter 3, remember that? Jonadab, the one that gets uh, Amnon to make the mistake that he does, the fatal mistake, with his sister. The Bible says about Jonadab, he was very subtle. All right, so this is a characteristic of the devil. And it says, uh, this woman has the attire of an harlot, and subtle of heart. Verse 11, she is loud and stubborn, her feet abide not in her house. Now is she without, now in the streets, and lieth in wait at every corner. You say, why? The connection for someone that's lying in wait is like they're waiting for the prey. They're waiting for something to come by so they can, can destroy it. All right? Uh, look at Proverbs chapter number 23. Proverbs chapter 23. And in Proverbs 23, there's a lot of warnings about uh, being drunk. And there's a connection between uh, drinking and loose living, we'll say. Uh, we'll put it that way. Uh, look at Proverbs tw uh, 23 and look at verse 27. Uh, for a whore is a deep ditch. And a strange woman is a narrow pit. She also lieth in wait as for a prey. You say, what is it? Like a lion, like crouching down. 
waiting for the prey to come by, and increaseth the transgressors among men. All right, so what you learn is that those, the, where that, that phrase shows up, uh, that phrase shows up, and that phrase is connected with someone that is waiting to hunt, waiting to pounce on somebody. And again, in Psalm chapter 10, the picture is that of a lion. Now think about this. Again, the devil is the greatest imitator of Jesus Christ. That's why when your Bible says, be ye followers of me as I follow Christ, it is not supposed to say, be ye imitators of me. You say, why? Because you know who an imitator is? Someone that can fake it, but they're not really following Jesus Christ. There's a difference. And, and the Bible says to follow Jesus Christ, not imitate. Why? Because the devil is the greatest imitator. And so think about this. Jesus Christ is called the lion of the tribe of Judah. So what does Satan do? Satan walks about as a, lion, as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And in Psalm chapter 10, that's why I don't think there's any coincidence about who this wicked person is. Uh, you'll notice, go back to Psalm chapter number 10. Psalm chapter number 10. And uh, you'll notice here in verse number 9 that says, He lieth in wait secretly as a lion in his den. You say, who is he looking for? The poor of verse number 8. All right? And it says, He lieth in wait to catch the poor. He doth catch the poor when he draweth him into his net. Now let me point out a couple things here that are interesting. Number one, uh, pragmatism does not always equal righteousness. See, what do you mean by that? Well, what I mean by that is this. Just because something works doesn't mean that it's right. Just because something is seen by the world as a, as a success doesn't mean that it's right. All right. The world looks at things and goes, well, if you made a lot of money, then let's do that. All right. Ignoring whether there's moral quality to the actions that were taken to get you there. All right. And uh, so here in, in verse number uh, 9, it says, He lieth in wait to catch the poor. You say, what does that mean? He's waiting to catch them. Then it goes on to say, He doth catch the poor. You know what that means? The Antichrist is successful. Does it mean he's right? Nope. <laughs> Just because something is successful or because it's, it's uh, pragmatic or what was the phrase that people would use? Uh, moral, uh, not moral equivalency, uh, uh, not moral relativity, but basically the, the end justifies the means. I'm forgetting the phrase there. All right. Uh, but the end justifies me. In other words, if the end is okay, it doesn't matter how we get there. If the, for example, the world is overpopulated, these are people that say they have never driven through Kansas or Wyoming. I tell you that right now, all right, all right, or Nebraska for that matter, all right, or for that matter, you know, northern Colorado or the western slope. Uh, but that, that all said, uh, here's one, the world is overpopulated, you know what we got to do? Got to kill some babies. You say, why? Because if, if everyone's born, then we just, there's no room for anybody. Well, we're doing a good thing. You say, why? Because we're saving the planet for the rest of us. And the end, in their mind, justifies the means. And it's wicked. Right? But, but the point is, in their own mind, it just so it's pragmatic, it works. Well, just because something works doesn't mean it's, it's right. And you learn that there in verse number uh, 9. It goes on to say, when he draweth them into his net. And uh, I would definitely uh, point out here, that's an interesting phrase, uh, there in verse number 9, you say, why? Uh, because uh, there in verse number 9, where it says, He doth cast the poor when he draweth him into his net. I want you to think about uh, what it is that the uh, World Wide Web is. Now, guys, now, guys calm, calm down, okay? I use email. I have a smartphone. I have apps. I'm not, you know, I'm not saying you hide in a hole and, and pretend that there's no internet. But... That said, understand it for what it is. Know what it is. The worldwide what? Web. See what happens in a web. Stuff gets stuck and stuff gets eaten. <laughs> what happens in the net? You know what you have a net for? To catch something. It's called the internet. And it says here in verse number 9 that uh, he doth catch the poor when he draweth him into his net. How are people going to be tracked all over the world? You say, how? The internet. Now, there's some blessings, guys. At Final Fight Bible Radio, uh, I thank the Lord that I can record something in my basement in Bennett, Colorado. It gets put into this cloud, and somebody grabs it and puts it onto a digital radio station, and the subject of missions and a study of missions is played for people to learn about missions. Praise the Lord for that. But for every one of those positive things that I could point out about the Internet, there's about 50,000 negative things. 
And I'm not saying you don't use it. I'm not saying that you throw it out. Now, if you can't handle it, get rid of it. But what I am saying is you have to recognize things in the world for what they actually are. Um, now, I don't want to get too political, but think about this. If you were to give the government unrestricted uh, access to private citizens' information in the attempt to catch terrorists, for example, that sounds like a good thing. You say, why? Because they're going to catch the bad guys. What happens when they make Christians terrorists? You understand what I'm saying? That's where the world's going to eventually go. And it has to go that way. You say, why? Because God said it would go that way. All right? Uh, am I excited about that? No. <laughs> But, you know, what? and on the other hand, I sort of am because, you know, it proves, it proves that God's right. When people uh, 30, 40 years ago, even, uh, you know, 20 years ago, some people really struggled with the idea, with the idea that the Antichrist could put up an image that the whole world could see. How are you going to do that? And they said, well, TV, can I say this? I lived in uh, Bolivia. I understand that your family's from there. Uh, we lived in Bolivia. And you know what's amazing? This is in 2005. This is really before the iPhone and all that kind of stuff. What blew me away was that people that lived on like 150 bucks a month had cell phones. And I can only imagine now, fast forward 11 years, they'd, they'd be having smartphones and everything else. I remember literally driving through a place that didn't have a bathroom, all right, and they didn't have central heat or air, and they didn't have a number of things, but they had a TV, and they had phones. They had cell phones. You say, what is that? The world is connected more than you know. We have the missionaries in Papua New Guinea, the, John, the Anderson family. And you know what the people, the, the Papua New Guineans have? They have cell phones literally in the jungle. You say, what is that? The world is connected. Go to Genesis chapter number 11. Let me show you what happens when man gets the whole world together and the, the, the gathering is not centered on the Lord. It's not centered on the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, there's going to come a day when the whole world will come to worship Him. <laughs> I like singing, uh, Oh, worship the King, all glorious above. You see why? Because I think about the day when the whole world, think about co-workers. Think about people that just have no use for God. The whole world will literally worship Jesus Christ. Every knee will bow. That's a blessing. Uh, and I think about that, and that, that blesses my soul. But having said that, when the whole world comes together and God's not in the picture, it does not end well. <laughs> uh, look at Genesis chapter number 11. Genesis chapter number 11. And uh, look there at verse number 3. They said one to another, go to, let us make brick, and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone, and slime had they for mortar. And they said, go to, let us build us a city and a tower, whose top may reach unto heaven, and let us make us a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. And you know what happens? There was your first United Nations assembly, and God came down and said, you all speak in different languages, and they were all separated. And uh, you say, what's going to happen when the whole world gets together? I'm glad you asked. Look at Zephaniah. Zephaniah is a real book in your Bible. <laughs> we went there last night, and one of the kids goes, that sounds like one of the St. John's names. <laughs> <laughs> Zephaniah. Zephaniah. And uh, as you get there, all right, now it comes after Habakkuk. It's between Habakkuk and Haggai. That may still not be a whole lot of help, but <laughs> it's in there, I promise uh, Zephaniah chapter number 3, and look at verse number 8. Therefore, wait ye upon me, saith the Lord, until the day that I rise up to the prey. Whoa. Flipping the, flipping the reversing roles here. Right now in Psalm chapter 10, we're reading about the Antichrist uh, treating the poor of the earth. Those have not taken the mark of the beast as, as those that are the prey to be sought out and to be hunted. But eventually the hunted uh, will no longer be the hunted. Eventually the hunter, the Antichrist, will become the hunted by the Lord himself. And the Lord rises up. This is the second coming of Jesus Christ. Not the rapture, but his battle of Armageddon. For my determination is to gather the nations. When an American says, I don't want us in the new world order. I don't want us in uh, you know, the, the UN. And I'll be honest with you guys, I don't either. But I'll tell you what, it's going to go that way. You say, why? Because God said it would. Now it says that I may assemble the kingdoms to pour upon them mine indignation, even all my fierce anger, for all the earth shall be devoured with the fire of my jealousy. That's the second advent of Jesus Christ. You read about that in Matthew 25 where he comes back and separates the sheep from the goats. All right. Uh, but that said, you say, why are the nations gathered so that God can come back and show them that they were wrong? That's why they're gathered. And, uh, and so what you're reading about in Psalm chapter 10 
uh, whether you ever recognized it or not before, there's some prophetic implications here. All right, go back to Psalm chapter number 10. We're going to wrap this up. Um, Psalm chapter 10. And, and again, there, there's, my goodness, there's so much on the devotional application side of things here uh, that, we need, that we could get into and that we have already gotten into. But I'm trying to point out to you, I, I, I may go over, I may overcompensate sometimes. And I'm, a, I'm fair warning to you right now. I might overcompensate sometimes and point out to you almost to a heavy extent the doctrinal or prophetic nature of Psalms, only because I feel like most commentaries, most things that are out there, never mention it at all. And all they ever point out is the devotional. All they ever point out is that part of it. And yes, that is there, and it is critical. Guys, you know what you get out, you get out of this thing? You get out of all kinds of things. Again, pragmatism is not always righteousness. Uh, you learn that there's a, uh, there should be some separation, some walls built in your life, so you don't get caught in the net. Amen? It's okay. It's okay to surf the net. It's a problem when you get caught in it. You understand what I'm saying? All right. Uh, there's all kinds of practical things here, but I want you to get the, 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 the prophetic implications here as well. Uh, again, looking at verse number 10, he croucheth and humbleth himself. Now, what does the lion do when it crouches? It's about to pounce. It's a false humility that's being expressed here. You say, why? Because, again, to deceive the world, no one could show up and say, I'm the devil, worship me. It's not how the Antichrist is going to show up. Hey, can I say this? That's not how temptation works in your life. Temptation doesn't show up and say, this is evil, this is sin, run for your life. Temptation says, one time won't hurt. Temptation says, everybody else is doing it. Temptation says, hey, they're a Christian, and they're doing it, and their family's okay, for now. Right? That's, how tempta- that's how the devil shows up. All right? Uh, he croucheth and humbleth himself that the poor may fall by his strong ones. He has said in his heart, never ever say, never find this in your heart, God hath forgotten. You say, why? Because God doesn't forget. Let me tell you one thing that God forgets that you better be glad about. The Bible says in Isaiah 38, 17, Behold, for peace I had great bitterness, but thou hast in love to my soul delivered it from the pit of corruption, for thou hast cast all my sins behind thy back. Thank God he forgets that. Amen? But you know what? He's not unrighteous to forget. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 6, your labor of love. And let me tell you another thing that God doesn't forget. He doesn't forget those that are calling on him for help. Uh, look at uh, 1 Samuel as an illustration. Let's look at 1 Samuel chapter number 1. 1 Samuel chapter number 1. You know, I read the Bible, and you know, there's some great, <laughs> there's some interesting things in the Old Testament. You know, one of the, 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 the biggest things that I've learned from reading my Old Testament these guys were dumb for having more than one wife. Amen. One is enough. Hallelujah. They're a blessing, but man, all the problems that come from having more than one, you would think eventually they would have figured it out. But they all make the same mistake over and over and over. Uh, look at 1 Samuel chapter 1. You've got uh, uh, Hannah and you've got uh, Penina, uh, the wife of uh, Elkanah. And uh, it says here in 1 Samuel chapter 1, in uh, verse number 19, look at this, verse 19. And they rose up in the morning early and worshipped before the Lord and returned and came to their house to Ramah. And Elkanah knew Hannah, his wife. And the Lord, what? Remembered her. He had never forgotten her. Now, why did he remember her? Look back in the chapter at verse number 6. And her adversary also provoked her sore. Women are catty. Mm. You ever notice that? Woman, a guy walks in, and they're wearing the same thing. Hey, what's going on, man? Look at that. Women walk in, like, ooh. <laughs> See, what is I don't know. It's this female thing. I'm not sure. I had four sisters growing up. I know what I'm talking about. I have three daughters, no sons. I know what I'm talking about, all right? But I want you to see here that, that uh, in verse 6, her adversary, Hannah's adversary, provoked her sore for to make her fret because the Lord had set up her womb. You know what she did? She had an adversary that was persecuting her. So Hannah went to the Lord for her deliverance. No differently than a Christian can have the devil persecuting him and, and attacking him. And you, you ought to do, learn to run to the Lord and lean on him and ask him to deliver you. And you know what the Lord will do? He'll remember you. No different than the tribulation saint, those poor Jewish people and those poor uh, Gentile believers that don't take the mark of the beast will be running for their lives from the Antichrist and they'll be calling on the Lord to, to help them, to deliver them. And the Antichrist thinks that he won no differently than devil. The devil probably thought he won at the cross 
and thank the Lord he spoiled principalities and powers, openly making a show of them and triumphing over them in it. Praise God for that. And in the end of it, God gets the last laugh. But the point is this, uh, God isn't going to forget. And I don't know, there may be some things you're facing tonight. You may think God has forgotten, but he hasn't. God remembers. Uh, go back to Psalm chapter 10, and we'll close there on a very practical note. Psalm chapter 10. And, and again, you know what you get all this? The Bible is practical, and it's very deep prophetically. All, the, all of it together. All of it together. Uh, again here it says, in verse number 12, we'll, we'll uh, end with this thought. Uh, Arise, O Lord, O God, lift up thine hand, forget not the humble. There's a prayer for God to rise up. That's, that's, the, that's the thing to pray for when you're in trouble. Lord, come, I need you. I need thee every hour. Amen? We'll, uh, we'll stop there. Any questions as we close out Psalm or chapter 10 there in verse 12? Any questions? No? All right. Well, let's go, Lord, in prayer. And uh, let's all stand and be dismissed in a word of prayer. The kids will be up here, I think, any moment. And uh, I know Miss Carrie wanted to, for those of you that can't stick around, you don't have to, but if you want to, I think she wanted to at least uh, thank the church for just uh, being a family to them and uh, express what the Lord's done in their lives. So let's be dismissed. Brother St. John, if you would, uh, dismiss us in a word of prayer.